Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily's The Sidebar, taking you inside the courtrooms of high profile and notorious cases from across the country. I'm your host, Joshua Ritter. I'm a criminal defense lawyer based here in Los Angeles and previously an LA County prosecutor for nearly a decade. We're recording this on Monday, April 18th, 2022. And today we are joined by Philip Hamilton, a renowned criminal defense attorney, adjunct law professor and legal analyst who you may have seen on Court TV and the Law and Crime Network. Philip, thank you so much for joining us. Gosh, it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me, my friend. Absolutely. Uh, Today's gonna be an exciting show because a couple of the cases, a few of the cases that we have been watching pretty closely over the last few weeks have finally concluded and we have verdicts to announce. So let's jump right in. Uh, The first is Michael Barrison, the former uh, Olympian faced an attempted murder charge in the shooting of Lauren Kanarek, who was an equestrian trainee of Barrison and of her fiance, Robert Goodwin. And just last Thursday, Barrison was found get this, not guilty by reason of insanity by the Morris County, New Jersey jury. Barrison's defense argued that Kanarek had psychologically manipulated Barrison to the point where he eventually broke broke down, causing him to arm himself with a gun and shoot Kanarek twice in the chest. Barrison will undergo a 30-day evaluation to determine whether he will be placed in a psychiatric hospital or returned to the community. Philip, let's jump right in. Did this verdict surprise you? It did, and I'll be even more specific as to why it did. Practicing here in the tri-state, I've had the opportunity and occasion at times to practice within Morris County, handle complex felony matters there. And what I can tell you about Morris County, it is a very conservative jurisdiction, relatively speaking, particularly in a blue state uh, known as New Jersey. It's, it, it's definitely a bit more conservative leaning, a bit more older. And certainly when it comes to issues of criminal justice, we're definitely not gonna say progressive in any respect, such that when you would think about putting on an insanity defense, that you would have jurors that would be receptive to how at times mental health does impact decision-making and how it could mitigate against culpability. So when we have a Morris County jury coming back in frankly, not that long of a fashion with a not guilty verdict by virtue of insanity, of course it's surprising because, you know, as you know, those verdicts are never easy to yeah. attain, but particularly when you're in a jurisdiction like that, I was very much surprised. That's interesting. I didn't know that about that county. I'm glad that you have that experience and insight you can share with us. Can you help uh, listeners understand how rare insanity defenses are? I mean, we I think TV makes it sound like that that's what everybody does in every case that they're charged with murder, but how rare is it to actually mount one of those defenses and be successful on it? I mean, great kind of bifurcation because even in regards to being able to ultimately plead insanity a lot of times in a lot of jurisdictions there's a bunch of procedural jump throughs that you have to get through as a defense attorney in order for the court to sign off essentially on that plea that requires a lot of um you know diagnoses that requires a lot of your client sitting down with doctors on both sides in terms of the defense and the prosecutorial side so even getting to the point where you can plead it is tough getting to the next point where you're actually able to successfully come out on the other side with an acquittal by reason of insanity, I think is even tougher because essentially what you're going in and admitting is, look, this ultimate act did happen. We're not running from the, it was, we're not running from the fact that it was my client. We're not saying this is a miss ID. We're not saying that this is a fabrication. All of those traditional defenses that as defense attorneys, we go into a case typically prepared for, you're throwing all that out the window. You're saying, hey, this did happen. However, my client is not culpable by some issue of their mental health, something that objectively you can't see and that subjectively as a jury, you're gonna have to buy and ultimately I'm gonna persuade you in buying that to acquit my client because up here, they didn't have the requisite intent, the malicious intent that otherwise is what we as a society punish these crimes by. Yeah, you, you, you do a good job of explaining how it's different than just being crazy. I mean, every, people I think who don't have experience with this think it just means that the person was suffering from r- mental problems and that's really not right. it. They have to not be able to form that, that intent like you mentioned, that they, they are so um, uh, uh, challenged by whatever kind of mental episode that they're going through that they can't even appreciate their actions or that they're right or wrong and that that is a huge hurdle to be able to get past. Uh, to that end, um, if you have watched this trial, Barrison himself was 
his demeanor in court, court was remarkable. I mean, there were several days where it looked like he was breaking down. He was disheveled. He he looked like he was falling apart in front of your eyes and certainly very different from the photos that we may have seen of him, uh, you know, riding a horse and w the former Olympian and just looking kind of kind of like a strong, uh, tall man. He looked like a, a, a shell of his former self. How much of a role do you think that played? Just his demeanor and, and looks in court with the jury? Josh, it's huge. Because thematically, as you noted, they're going in with the defense that he had been broken down. And that ultimately that kind of psychological manipulation is what brought him to this place that in any other respect, in any other time in his life, he wouldn't be when it came to committing these acts, when it came to ultimately committing you know, murder. And so to the extent that the jury, and let's be frank to the extent, and I know, you know, Josh, you've tried a lot of cases out in California and on the defense side, we are always very cognizant and informative with our clients in terms of telling them, look, you know, trial is theater, all right? The jury is the audience, the well of the courtroom is the stage. You are in their eyesight, their mind, their thoughts throughout the course of this process. They're watching you. So you have to watch the way in which you look at people, the way in which you walk into the courtroom, like everything that you do is observable as a defendant. Such a good point you make. And, and it, it, we're going to contrast it to a case we're going to talk about a little bit later where the circumstances of the murder were so insane, yet the way that that this defendant uh, presented themselves in court was not. So just a, a little tease for things that are to come. Um, do you think the prosecution made any errors in this case? Do you think that they they somehow missed it? Because, the, I mean, like you pointed out, this wasn't a whodunit. I mean, they had the evidence. He, he sh put two bullets into somebody's chest and shot, shot at another person's head. As far as his intent to murder, I think that's clearly established by the, the facts and evidence. Did they miss the ball? Maybe not take this insanity defense too seriously. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, based upon what I said, you know, a little bit earlier, just in terms of from a jurisdictional standpoint, the jurors that a lot of these Morris County prosecutors are probably typically used to dealing with, I'm not going to come out and put anybody, you know, in the line of fire in regards to you made this error, you made this mistake, and this is ultimately why the state didn't prevail. But what I will say is just, you know, look, from an experiential standpoint, I'm sure none of those prosecutors have extensive experience, particularly out in Morris County, which, you know, is not, let's say, in Essex County where Newark is or, you know, certainly in New York County in terms of, you know, Manhattan and things along those lines where you're going to be seeing more just murders in general. I don't know if they even right. typically try a lot of murders out there to begin with, let alone this, you know, added layer of now insanity, which which we have to go in and like technically dissect and like essentially prove in many respects that he did know that his actions were wrong. It's not an easy task for your most seasoned homicide prosecutors, but I think probably out in Morris County, you know, if they're doing some Monday quarterbacking, I'm sure they're looking back and saying, well, maybe we could have approached this differently or maybe that. But look, at the end of the day, to the extent that the defense was able to humanize their client and prove that that moment was an ultimate anomaly in the course of his life by virtue of, you know, the place where he was mentally at that point, you know, what can you do? The jury's spoken. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so last question on this before we move on. Uh, what are your thoughts? He's, he's supposed to go through this 30-day evaluation. If, if it's determined that he is recovered from whatever episode he was suffering from, he could be released. I mean, what do you think the chances of something like that are of happening? It really boils down to how ultimately that analysis comes out, right? In, in regards to like how likely it is or how likely... It isn't. I mean, look, the fact of the matter is if, if they find, you know, that he is at a point where he is, you know, not a danger to society, where, you know, mentally he can, you know, move forth within society uh, in a means that, you know, his sickness is not going to inhibit him or place the community in danger by law at this point, um, you know, they're not going to be able to hold him. All right. He was found not guilty by insanity. So there's no period of incarceration. And there's no period ultimately short of the fact that he may again be mentally still suffering some of the ill effects that could make him a danger to the community. If those aren't there or, you know, analyzed to be found, he's going to have to be released. Incredible. And the jury was okay with that. Yeah. It, it, it's amazing that the turn of events at one point he's looking at spending the rest of his life in prison. And now it may be a matter of days before he's he's out and 
riding horses again. Pretty incredible. All right, uh, turning to the Anthony Todd case. Now, this is the one that I was kind of referencing earlier. This is an absolute nightmare of a case. Um, and we have another verdict. Again, on Thursday, Anthony Todd, in this case, was found guilty of murdering his wife, children, and dog. Um, and he will spend the rest of his life in prison without the possibility of parole. The bodies of the family were found in various states of decomposition in their upscale Celebration, Florida, that's the name of the town, home, which is near Disney World Resort. And it, it, I don't know why this is such an interesting wrinkle in this story to me, but I did a little research on Celebration, Florida, and it's one of those planned communities. Um, it was actually originally developed by the Disney company, and it looks exactly what, like what you would imagine the Disney version of a perfect American small town would look like. It's like something out of that movie, The Truman Show. Um, anyhow, authorities believe he may have lived in the house for up to three weeks after giving his family members Benadryl and stabbing him. I guess that's the part that makes the town so remarkable to me, that you have this picture-perfect town and this just atrocity taking place behind one of those closed doors. Uh, initially, authorities alleged that Todd confessed to killing his wife. However, Todd a reverse course and later entered a plea of not guilty, alleging that his wife had in fact killed the children and then herself. Uh, he also said that it would, at one point he said that it was a joint plan between himself and his wife to prepare for what they believe was the, uh, the coming apocalypse. Um, this case being in Florida, are you surprised first uh, but that the prosecution didn't pursue the death penalty? I mean, I know that they had noted that there may have been some concerns that they had, you know, in regards to Todd's mental health. So yeah. um, it, more more than surprised, you know, I would. No, you know what? <laughs> I guess, Josh, I could kind of go there. You know, I, I am surprised okay. because from a political standpoint, and, you know, as you and I know, and you as a former prosecutor, you know, these district attorney's offices, they are political offices, right? Like these district yeah. attorneys are held to the voters, you know, every four to eight to 10 years, depending upon the jurisdiction. And so for a case like this, where when we talked about, you know, the case earlier where, you know, thematically there was a hook there for, you know, that defendant to be able to, you know, in, in, in some respects, get the sympathy of the jury. That's where I'm trying to go here. You know, here, this is not a sympathetic case in any way. And, and that's why we had the verdict come out the way in which it did against this defendant, you know, a verdict of guilt. So for the prosecutor's office to say, you know, we're not going to go death penalty here, even though, you know, from a political standpoint, it could be something, especially in Florida, that could maybe be helpful to this prosecutor. You know, I guess what I would say is just from, you know, a kind of progressive standpoint, you, you, you got to give the district attorney's office a bit of kudos only to the extent that if they felt that there really would be a miscarriage of justice by virtue of those mental health issues, you know, it, what, what can you say? You, you make such a good point. I, I, the way I would look at it is that if they had pursued the death penalty, I don't think anybody would be pounding their fists on the table saying that's that's unjust. In a, in right. a case like this that is so heinous, the victims are so innocent. I mean, I, I, I don't even want to describe the way that he took like his youngest child's life in a case that awful i don't think you're going to find many people sympathetic to the idea that the death penalty is being used here but you you make an excellent point that if they felt that somehow his mental state could lead to a miscarriage of justice maybe they were just being kind of um looking on the horizon and making sure that this was a verdict that stuck Let's let's kind of compare this now that we're talking about this case to the last one. As far as these insanity defenses, here you have a case that seems to be dripping with insane actions, right? Killing your family, killing the dog. He even testified, and I want to get your thoughts on that too. He even testified in court, yet that that didn't carry the day. And contrast that to Barrison, if you could, a little bit too, where he, he, his actions though they may have been uh, uh, coming from a, a, a place of mental anguish, don't appear it just at first blush to be as quote unquote insane. What are your thoughts on the, the, the contrast between these two cases? Uh, very well put, Josh, like in the, in the way that even like you, you, you characterize the question, because I, I get what you're saying, right? It's like, if we're going to look at somebody, and, and we mentioned this when we were talking about Barrison, that when we talked about how an insanity defense does not mean you are crazy. Right. Because like that's from a colloquial standpoint, 
where we often go as lay people, you know, particularly before I ever became an attorney, when I would hear, you know, an insanity defense, I would be like, oh, okay, this person's crazy. And we just leave it at that. So of course, like what we're saying here in regards to Todd, he, he sounds crazy. I mean, to be able to do that to your family, you know, your, your children, the dog, I mean, goodness, it, it, it's just absolutely unimaginable in many respects. And you would just say he had to be insane in order to do something like that. But from a legal perspective, okay, did he have the story with which to go in? Like when we talk about Barrison, we're talking about, again, I think an effective defense wherein they're going in saying he was psychologically manipulated by this person, right? In terms like almost shedding like a negative light upon the victims, right? The decedents, like that they were not perfect and that they in some respects contributed to his actions. Whereas here, you're just not gonna get a jury to buy that your children, your young children in any way could contribute to you taking this twist, even if, right? Even if from a mental health component, you actually were insane in the moment. We're now asking a jury of lay people to excuse that action. Even if legally, that's not what it says within the jury instructions, we're asking them to excuse it. And so even if he was insane, this is just the kind of case where one out of a million times, maybe you'll get that, you know, not guilty by insanity. But generally, this is the kind of verdict you expect here, short of like literally it being somebody else that committed the murder as opposed to your client. Yeah. And, and to your point, too, I wonder, you know, he had shifting uh, kind of statements here. At first, it was it was I had nothing to do with this. Then it, then he confessed to it. Then he said, well, it was kind of we did it together. We planned it. it we were worried about the apocalypse. Um, and then he took the stand uh, and, and gave statements on the stand as to what took place. So do you think I guess one of my couple of questions here first do you think the jurors saw that shifting narrative as maybe somebody who does have their mental faculties about them and are just trying to evade uh, capture or evade being found guilty? And also what what, you know, always the def the question for a defense attorney is, do you put your 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 client on the stand? Do you think that was a wise decision here for the the taught defense team? OK, so to point one, um, you know, when we talk, of, well, actually, you know what? Let's go to point two. <laughs> we'll actually start. <laughs> so in terms of just, is it a wise decision to put your client on? That is always a very, very scientifically pointed, you know, conversation and discussion you're having with your client, but also taking a lot of your reasoned analysis as a trial attorney and determining what does this add to our theory of defense? Does this help us? Does this hurt us, right? And I think so now going back to your first point, right, to thread that back in, the issue in terms of the evasive initial responses to what happened, it completely and totally undercuts what we're talking about when you're pleading an insanity defense, which is could you appreciate the wrongfulness of your actions? And if you are evasively switching up your story, it sounds like you are very rationally, logistically and competently thinking through ways to make yourself look less wrong, which means that there must have been an appreciation that you were wrong. So yeah. if you have that in this case, is this the case then where I'm putting my client up on the stand to be able to swim through all of those different responses and, you know, essentially just get beat up on the stand in a way that, you know, let's, let's go a little deeper, Josh. Frankly, probably the jury wanted to see him get beat up, right? Just to have some kind of moment of, of joy with everything they had to hear and see throughout the course of that trial, for him to go up there, I just don't see how it helps. But hey, maybe the defense was saying, this case is such an uphill battle, how does it hurt, right? right. Maybe something does come out that gives him you know, the hook, but it's, it's a game time decision. I'm not gonna fault the defense. And I would probably have to have been in the case, like really in the case, like in that jail, talking to him to determine if I'm making that decision. But it's definitely one I would have aired more on the conservative side and probably not put them on just generally yeah. surface level. No, I, I totally agree. I The way I explain it to people is that your client has really just got to knock it out of the park because they are under so much scrutiny from the jurors. They're going to be under cross-examination from a person who knows what they're doing, yeah. especially in a case like this where he's got these inconsistent prior statements. How, like you said, how is he going to navigate those waters successfully? But in defense of the defense, 
Uh, something that a lot of people don't understand is sometimes that decision is in the hands of the client. And if they want to testify, as much as the, their, their attorney may tell them, I think this is a horrible choice, they may insist upon it. And now you're in a position where you got to throw them up there and do the best that you can. And who knows if that existed in this case? We'll, we'll never know. But I think the jurors uh, uh, came came back with the correct verdict, and I'm, I'm glad to hear it. Um, okay. Uh, another case uh, that we've been following for a while now is the, the trial of Dr. William Husel. And uh, the third day of deliberations for the Columbus, Ohio jury concluded on last Thursday. Uh, the trial lasted just over 30 days. And what we have been told is that the jury has now at least started to indicate to the judge that they may be deadlocked. The latest that we heard was that they had indicated they've come to an impasse, but the judge sent them right back in there and said, you got to keep on working. And, I, and, and Philip, I want to get your thoughts on that, because I think I, I know where you might be going as far as how this judge would feel about uh, having a mistrial in this case. Uh, the former Mount Carmel ICU doctor is facing 14 counts of murder for the alleged overprescription of fentanyl and other drugs. And these were uh, patients that were critically ill or near death. On Thursday, another interesting thing took place. The jurors uh, had a question if they could review an exhibit. I'm thinking it was from closing arguments detailing how medications were uh, removed from a dispensing machine in the hospital's ICU. And this was the third time that jurors have asked to review something that was not entered into evidence. And the court has, of course, denied that request. And we'll get into that. But before we do, um, as trial attorneys, we're always trying to predict what the jurors are thinking. And first of all, they've given us a huge hint here that they, they may be at an impasse. And I know this is all reading tea leaves, but what are your thoughts on these jurors requesting to see these exhibits that were used? And I, my understanding is that they were defense exhibits. It's the power of demonstratives in the <laughs> course of when you talk about a week, two week, three week long trial. And even if it's a shorter trial, but just with like very complex issues, you know, it's ultimately the demonstratives. And that's why attorneys use it, right? We consult a lot with psychologists and, um, you know, with those like forensic oriented psychologists that can kind of help us have a better understanding of what's persuasive to the human mind and what's not. And it's so funny how, you know, basically a terabyte worth of evidence and documents within a trial can be summed up on a poster board or on a PowerPoint slide. And it's like, that's the one thing that pushes the jury over to this side as opposed to that side. It's like, did you not hear everything else that we introduced <laughs> about the course of the trial? The hours every evening that I was prepping on this witness and that witness. And it was that PowerPoint slide that ultimately like swayed you over here. So it, it's the power of demonstratives. And, and, and ultimately a reason, Josh, why, you know, if I'm in the middle of a trial, the government, the prosecution, whomever, you know, starts to send over like the slides that they're going to use either in openings or summations. I don't just, you know, cakewalk it through to say, yes, that's OK. I'm really looking at those because it may be an issue of litigation and things that I need to keep out because that one thing could be a total deflection from the actual evidence within the case. So, you know, I think this moment is just a testament to that in this trial. Yeah, it, it, it helped us understand, too, because so much of the work of a trial is done outside of the presence of the jury. There's so right. much litigation that takes place about what is that universe that they're going to be exposed to and how they're not allowed to consider things outside of that, even if those are things they may have seen in court. If that's not admitted evidence, that doesn't go back to them. Could you tell us about that and why that's important that we operate that way? Well, I mean, just because, you know, defendants, particularly in criminal cases, have due process rights and to essentially be putting documents and materials in front of a jury that ultimately have no actual bearing upon the facts of the case, even if from a demonstrative standpoint, it is to simply outline or highlight a point that is being made about the evidence. It's not the actual evidence. And to submit that to the jury, what the judge would essentially be doing is setting themselves up for a potential issue on appeal, wherein, you know, now the case has to come back, which we can already see and you and I preliminarily discussed in regards to why the judge is telling them right now, like, hey, I see that you're at a deadlock, but you need to go back in there and figure it out because no trial judge wants to try a subsequent case. I mean, I've heard trial judges tell it to me before, 
in the sense that it's akin to, you know, when you get back in the car from the beach and you have the, the wet swimming trunks with the sand in it, just like the way that that feels, they've equated that to the <laughs> feeling of trying another case after like a mistrial in the first case, right? Like that's the feeling, nobody wants to go through it. So certainly the judge isn't gonna put themselves on the hook with some demonstrative being the issue on appeal that ends up kicking the case back and then they have to retry it. Yeah, yeah, I left that analogy. Um, again, we're not trying to Monday morning quarterback anybody here, but a couple of interesting strategic decisions were made by both sides in this case, and I wanna hear your thoughts. First of all, uh, we talked about putting your, your client on the stand already, but Husel did not testify uh, on his own behalf in this case, which I actually thought to be one of those instances that might be a rare example of where it would be good for him to testify. Give, give us your thoughts on that decision in this case. The only thing I can think, and, I, and I'm with you, Josh, and you know there probably are those moments you've had, I've had, where you are, you know your client has the moral high side with a particular jury okay i'm not saying just in general or i'm not saying in one respect or another that my view of this case is that he was morally right or wrong but maybe in you know looking at this jury they say hey we have the moral high ground just from what we know of these jurors and the way that the case has played out if you can just go in and like get this testimony out and tell this story in the way that it needs to be told you are going to be best positioned to come out with the acquittal but then what inevitably happens you get into those prep sessions with your client they can't tell a story. It's one word answers. It's they're nervous. They, and, and you start doing the you know mock cross examinations and they're just doing terrible. And their anxiety is getting to a point where even though there's a great story to tell, they can't tell it. And you can't get on the stand, Josh, and I can't get on the stand to tell that story, maybe in those cases as much as we would want to. So even though, yes, maybe it may have been a good decision if you could tell the story to get up there and tell it, maybe just there was the final decision of i think it's just best for us just to rest on the theory without you going up there and kind of screwing it up yeah yeah testifying is far more easier said than done you you get up there on that chair everybody's watching you everybody in the courtroom you're under cross-examination there's even tv cameras yeah that's a hard hard situation to be in and to be able to quote unquote perform even if everything you're saying is 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 truth coming out of your mouth it's yeah. theater like we talked Absolutely. about earlier you know yeah um now on the prosecution side uh one thing i thought was interesting and we talk about this all the time but they say that the prosecution does not have to prove motive and that's true but to me in this case that is the elephant in the room is You've given me all this evidence saying that he's he's overdosing people and he's giving them far more than most uh, practitioners would and all. But why? Why would this man do this? Why would this respected by all accounts before any of this uh, uh, physician take it upon himself to take the lives of these folks who were near death as it was? And I know it's a tragedy to hear that your loved one might have been taken earlier than they should have been. Um, but why? And I, the prosecution, I don't think, gave that answer. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah, why would be the most important? Because it's, you know, are we dealing with just a, a flat out sociopath? Right. Or are we dealing with someone who just very compassionately has views that are, whereas against the law, you know, generally speaking, when it comes to these end of care, you know, life termination decisions, that like he was coming from, in his heart a good place right even if society is saying like hey we don't know about this in terms of from a legislative standpoint we're going to allow this to be the norm but you know what place was he coming from and i think that's something that is always going to be important to a jury in these kinds of cases you know it's like the defense in a trial there's never any burden to prove innocence but certainly you know any seasoned trial attorney will tell you you need to go in there with some kind of story of innocence right, right? even if you're right. not proving it you better have a story and i think on the flip with the prosecution, what the jury's always looking for is they need a motive. Yeah, it doesn't have to be proven, but if you don't have it, it certainly doesn't help your case from a prosecutorial standpoint. Yeah, you make such a good point. A, a mentor of mine, talk to, to your point about how you can't, as a defense, you have to have some story. Uh, a mentor of mine would always say, you need a bad guy. 
And if the bad guy is not your guy, well, then you got to give him somebody else who's the bad guy. And is that the police or is that some other suspect or who is it? But you got to give him somebody. Um, and I think that's the same here that you don't have to prove motive. And we know that. But you have to give something for the jurors to hang their hats on in a case like this because it just doesn't make sense otherwise. Um, last question on this, and then we'll move on uh, to, to our f our finale circus case. Uh, but um, the what are you what are your thoughts on if this comes back with a, a guilty verdict? What are your thoughts on the repercussions throughout the medical community, especially in for those providing end of care life? I'm I'm curious to to hear what you think. We've had these cases, you know. I, I remember. Um, I mean, I'm taking us what back to like the early '90s. Remember, uh, Doctor, you know, Kevorkian. Remember, like when that nope. was like a huge, you know, national like 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 pre OJ. That that was the thing we were all kind right. of talking about, and it's kind of what kicked off this conversation that you know really is still a lot of the underpinnings of this case and i think that you know if we do have a guilty verdict you know i think that community that is you know in favor of kind of the compassionate life termination assistance there is something like moral within that community with which they abide by that i think even a guilty verdict it doesn't take because they already know that they're operating in a very shaky kind of shady area anyway, wherein they could be prosecuted and ultimately convicted. So, you know, I don't know if you see much of a change in terms of the stemming of said acts as much as if there's a guilty verdict, you will start to see more grassroots kind of passionate calls for reform and change in the event of a conviction would be my prediction. Yeah, no, it's got to have some repercussions because I, I can't imagine, like you said, it, they realize that they're, they're, they're dealing in a very gray area of the practice of medicine. But if I'm a doctor who does practice that kind of medicine, I want double, triple checking on everything I do because yeah. I don't want to be sitting in this same position yeah. uh, that Dr. Husserl is. All right, uh, moving on. Uh, it's the case of Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard. Uh, the landmark defamation suit filed by Depp against his former spouse, Amber Heard. On Thursday, a witness for Depp was dismissed after admitting to watching clips of the defamation trial online. Not surprising given the amount of incredible attention given to this trial. Uh, and her testimony was completely struck from the record by the judge. The other thing that we're noticing is that Depp's drug usage has become a major focal point throughout the trial, as Heard alleges that Depp regularly assaulted her while under the influence of drugs or alcohol, and that he would, in, in her words, become a monster. Um, all right, first question, Philip, and it's a it's a it's a big one because it's about the whole thing to begin with. Was this a smart move for Depp to even bring this lawsuit? I'm curious to hear what you think. When you bring a civil lawsuit, you know, you and I have spent a lot of this, you know, show talking about criminal cases. But when you bring a civil lawsuit, the way in which it opens up your life in the discovery process and what is relevant is there's just so much more from a reputational standpoint that frankly can be damaging in civil cases than criminal cases, which is the irony here. Right. No. <laughs> the irony is that he's moving forward on claims to essentially get redress for what he is claiming is the reputational harm from, you know, these statements that were made against him. But then you get into the trial, people start to learn more about you, kind of the skeletons that you have in the closet, things that, you know, you've tried to sweep under the rug. It's all fair game. So that's always kind of the irony sometimes when people bring the defamation suits, because what's always the defense to defamation? The truth. Right. If ultimately what I said was the truth, even if it's reputationally harmful, it's not defamatory. And so, you know, I think that it I don't know, is it a wise decision if he cared about the reputational harm? I'd have to kind of say no. I completely agree with you. That, that's been my, my question from the beginning, because first of all, a couple of things. He doesn't need the money. Right. This isn't this isn't like a guy who, who who's destitute. I mean. I don't think this was motivated by money. I think he was hurt, and I think he there is some pretty uh, um, significant evidence that he lost out on some pretty big deals, but I don't think money was it at all. I agree with you that his attorneys must have sat down and had long conversations with him about your entire, your dirty laundry is going to be out there for everybody to see. And the other thing is, 
he wasn't named in the Washington Post opinion piece that is the subject of all of this, which is another hurdle that they're going to have to get past. Even if they're able to prove uh, that, yeah, her words had an impact on him, they're going to have to prove, was she even talking about him from the beginning? Uh, it's just, to me, this was one of those things where um, he may have had a lot of legal advice, but nobody tells Johnny Depp what to do. And if Johnny Depp wants to see her in court and have his day in court, then he's going to go ahead and, and have it. How large of a detriment or how hurtful is it to Depp the fact that all this kind of drug usage is coming out? Do you think that's going to hurt him in this case? I mean, look, man, Johnny Depp was, you know, in many respects, especially earlier in his career, um, but still like that, that reputation last, he was like the epitome of Hollywood. You know, this is 21 Jump right. Street, this is Edward Scissorhands, <laughs> you know, the biggest, you know, heartthrob back, like, you know, we're talking early 90s or what have you. So, you know, it's not lost on all of us and, and we won't even talk about, you know, blow and things along those lines, right? Like right. that movie. So, I, you know, I think would it come as a, I don't know, like a like a shock to the you know general populace. Oh my God! Like this A-list Hollywood right. celebrity was was, was people, using drugs. And, people you know, clutching their pearls. <laughs> right. Oh, no, where, where is the world going? <laughs> right. You know, I, I don't know necessarily if it if if it goes there. Right. It's it's not like this is like Pat Robertson or something like that, where like he was on trial, this stuff was coming out. We'd be like, oh my, oh my God. But for Johnny Depp, like you know, I I, I don't know. I mean, that's probably something that his attorneys did discuss with him, and he said, look. You know, I can kind of live with that in regards to like if that's going to be a con to moving forward with this, as you were alluding to, Josh, you know, he was probably just like on principle. Nevertheless, I'm moving forward because it's not about the money. It's just on principle. I can't like stand by and just let people talk about me or at least as I'm interpreting them to be talking about me. If that is, in fact, the case then I'm going to move forward on a claim such as this. Yeah. Who knows if it, it could have been just a, a massive PR move that he's thinking to himself, I'm already dirty. I might as well do as much as I can to dirty her up. And maybe that's my only way of kind of salvaging my career here. I, I don't know. Or to uh, chill I, her or, you know, yeah. I don't know, like taking some kind of sacrificial lead for, you know, A-listers to say like, hey, I'm, I'm going to, you know, do something in regards to stopping this for all right. of us. I don't know. Yeah, don't know. who knows? Um, well, another interesting development that came out is that a therapist of both of theirs testified last week that she believes uh, that there was what she described as mutual abuse that took place. Uh, what effect do you think that will have on the jury? Well, we, this is where we can now like thematically go back and like think through some of the other cases we were talking about, like who's the bad guy, right? right? Like who has the, the, the moral ground to get the hook for the you know jury's sympathy and, and what have you. And so when you have that mutuality, you know, as is discussed here, it, especially in a civil case where we're not talking about guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, we're talking about a preponderance of the evidence, which is essentially 51% to 49% that something was more likely than not to have happened as opposed to the fact that it didn't. And, you know, I think in a case like this, it, it, it makes it a little bit more difficult as a plaintiff, uh, you know, in death situation to ultimately prevail when you can't be ultimately painted as the singular sole good person who was aggrieved by the bad person. Makes it a little bit more difficult here. No. Yeah. All right, you're not a publicist, but I want you to put on your publicist hat and tell me what are the what are the chances? I mean, what does Depp's career recover from this? Are we going to see him, you know, in a in a pirate costume again soon? Uh, do, do we see him in a pirate costume again? I don't know if that franchise ultimately decides to move forward. Maybe because it's so big, they start to look in different directions. But in regards to other, like, could he have other hit movies, big indies? He's still Johnny Depp, right? right. Regardless of right. kind of what has come up, he's still an amazing actor. He's still, you know, brilliantly gifted in that respect. So I just don't see him just, you know, just falling off the face of the earth or certainly the big screen. I think ultimately he'll be okay. This is just kind of a... I don't know if you want to say like an embarrassing moment that he has to kind of go through. But hey, this is what you sign up for, you know, when you're an A-lister. <laughs> Good point. Uh, Philip, thank you for, so much for coming on this week. Where can people find out more about you? Oh, again, Josh, thanks so much for having me. Um, you can find me on social media. My handle is ESQ Hamilton. That's across platforms. Uh, and of course, uh, my firm's website is Hamilton Clark LLP dot com and in Clark there's an E at the end of Clark. 
Thank you so much. And I'm your host, Josh Ritter. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Joshua Ritter ESQ. And you can find our sidebar episodes wherever you get your podcasts. And we want to hear from you. If you've got questions or comments you'd like us to address, tweet us your questions with the hashtag TCD sidebar. And thank you for joining us at the True Crime Daily Sidebar. Sidebar.